my feeling is, and I, I assume a lot of people agree, I mean, I know a lot of people do agree, which is that it's never too late to do the right thing. Yeah. I think the stakes here are extremely high. And even when it's the bare minimum, I mean, Mike Pence, you know, did the bare minimum at the end. I think it should be praised. I mean, obviously, nothing exists in a vacuum and there's a larger context. But uh, yeah, I'm all for anyone doing the right thing, no matter how late in the game it is. Um, welcome to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I am, of course, Donnie Deutsch, and this is On Brand. And this is a podcast, as you know, you're listening to it. And the premise of this podcast is a simple one. The premise is that everything's a brand today. Uh, every person, every celebrity, every athlete, every company, every product, uh, every movement, uh, every political party, everything is a brand. And a brand is a set of values. And we do two things here. Uh, first, we interview a person about their own personal brand. And today it'll be uh, star political writer, Mark Leibovich. He's got a new book out about the Trump enablers. Really fascinating book that focuses on the uh, Republican establishment, the Mitch McConnells of the world and the uh, the Lindsey Grahams that, that kind of became Trump's lapdogs. And it's a fascinating, fascinating book. He's a former New York Times magazine editor, uh, writer for The Atlantic, brilliant, brilliant guy. He's got a lot to talk about. And we also do our Brands of the Week. Uh, and those are basically the brands that are kind of shaping the zeitgeist, driving what's going on in the world, uh, who's going where and why. Let's get right into it. First up, brand up for Democrats. Um, despite Biden's awful approval rating, and he's at, I think, 38% according to uh, culmination of polls. I think that's the lowest that a president has been in a long, long time. And that includes Trump. But still, Democrats are polling ahead of the GOP in what they call the winning the issues survey. It's kind of a generic ballot poll about which issues do you line up with more than Democrats or Republicans. And they said that 57% would vote Democrat or leaning that way versus just 41%. For Republican, and that's a reversal from just in May, 45% of Americans either back the Republicans or lean Republican versus 44 for the Democrats. So that's a huge shift. That's a that's a six point six or seven point shift. That's a dramatic shift in such a short period of time. And it goes to what I've talked a lot about on Morning Joe about, and I've talked about it on this show, that um, although we've got a an economy that an inflation that is is really struggling right now, and Biden does not seem to have his hands firmly on the steering wheel. The crazy factor are the Republicans, and they're, they're the Looney Tunes that, that, that they're putting up for running for office. Watching January 6th, the, the overturn of Roe v. Wade, nothing going down on guns. Uh, all of that adds up to a party that's unhinged and a far-right extremist party that they're self-destructing, despite what's happening in a very soft economy. So brand up for the Democrats. Brand up for Pete Buttigieg. Uh, we haven't heard his name in a long time. Pete Buttigieg, of course, Transportation Secretary. Former uh, ran for office, ran for the was in the primaries, obviously in in, in 2020. Um, he is out polling uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, current president Joe Biden. So there you go. I have a list of possible candidates. Democrats. Biden received 16 percent, and and Buttigieg was 17 percent, followed by Elizabeth Warren, uh, Gavin Newsom. Each came in at 10 percent, and also Bernie Sanders is still there at less than 10 percent. When respondents were asked about their second choice for the 2020 presidential candidate, Booker received the most support. So it's interesting uh, how he got a, a second uh, place vote. M more people see him as their second choice. I don't understand why. Um, but the big news there is people to judge. This is interesting. Brand up or brand down, it depends where you look at it. I'm going to give them a brand up for old Trump voters. When I say old, I mean age-wise Trump voters. That in a recent survey, conducted by CNN and SSRS, found that 70% of those age 65 and over said they would vote for a GOP candidate in the midterm congressional. 49% said they would vote for Democrat. Now, this is a striking difference between May when 62% said they would back a Republican candidate and only just 37% of seniors. That is stunning. And I think that that maybe speaks to, you know, cable news skews older. You know, the average person watching CNN and, and MSNBC and Fox and, and the other news out, you know, are like in 60, 65 plus. And they're the ones that are tuning in to the January 6th hearings. So maybe that's having a profound effect. But I, there's wisdom in age, I always say. And Republic and, you know, older voters, which traditionally skew GOP, are there's a backlash against Trump. It's, it's really interesting. And I thought that was fascinating. Brand down for Doug Mastriano. I, I, I ranted about this on, on Morning Joe. He is, the, of course, the governor running against Josh Shapiro in the state of Pennsylvania. And this guy is somewhere right of Attila the Hun. I, I mean, 
he um uh, I don't want I don't want to say he's right up until that's an expression I shouldn't say that I'm going to take that back he's extremely right wing to the point where he is um he's given money to gab which is a social basically a social site a social media website that is dedicated to anti-semitism and racism I mean this is where the the the, the terrorist I'll call him a terrorist who, who who killed all those people in Buffalo with uh with, did his racial and racist rants on the site. The site talks about white Christian nationalism and and taking back from the Jews and all those wonderful great hits. And this is where Mastriano has aligned himself with. And he has since come out and said, no, but this is where he was funding money. This is where he's buying ads. This is where he's, he is he has lauded the founder of the site. I'm not even know the founder's name. I'm not even going to dignify it. But this is running for. This is also the guy who said that if he gets elected with one strike of his pen, he will overturn any any uh, election results that he deems inappropriate or uh, not going his way in another way. This is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous guy. Uh, he was there on January 6th uh, by the busloads. Uh, this is frightening. This is the actual Republican candidate. And 40% of voters in, in, in Pennsylvania are still voting for him. I mean, he's losing to Josh Shapiro by 10 points, which is significant. But um, there you go. Doug Mastriano, that's a huge brand down. Brand down for the Supreme Court and a brand up for term limits on the Supreme Court. This is interesting. And we've talked a lot about the Supreme Court and, and what's going wrong recently. 67% of Americans favor term limits for Supreme Court justices per a new poll from AP and, and Nork, Nork Center for Public Affairs Research. That's amazing. Two out of three Americans right now think there should be term limits on the Supreme Court, as do I. I think 18 years is a good number. They should not be there for life. I don't think anybody should be appointed to life for anything. Um, and that's that's go. And the Democrats, uh, no surprise, are introducing certain Democrats, a group of House Democrats, introduced a bill last week to enact term limits for Supreme Court justices, arguing the move will restore legitimacy and independence to the nation's highest court. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. The legislation is titled Supreme Court Tenure Establishment and Retirement Modernization Act. It would, would authorize the president to nominate Supreme Court justices every two years in the first and third years after presidential election. And so we will see. Brand up for Rupert Murdoch. And you don't often say that only because it seems that him and Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and New York Post are really, as each week goes by, distancing themselves from Donald Trump. The Post and uh, the Wall Street Journal have wrote scathing editorials against him and against January 6th. I mean, duh. But still, st still a pleasant uh, happening of things. And he's getting much, much less coverage. He gave a speech last week. They didn't cover it all. They covered Pence's speech. And, you know, the the word within media circles in, in New York is that Murdoch has had it with Trump. He thinks he's a losing proposition and he'll probably get behind DeSantis. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. And and Trump without Fox News, that's a big problem if you're Donald Trump. Uh, still, he's got Tucker Carlson and a couple of the other primetime hosts, but even um, Sean Hannity seems to have cooled off on him. So we're going to watch that. But let's give Rupert Murdoch a brand up for that at least. This is weird. I don't want to say brand down. Of course, Ukrainian President Zelensky is a hero, as is his wife. Uh, but they're posing on the cover of Vogue, and it's all about his wife, Alina Zelenska, um, something they a lot of people feel it's crossed the line into vanity territory. And I, I don't know. Your, your country is in war. He's been very masterful at using the media. He gave that speech at the, the Grammy Awards. But um, they're on the cover of Vogue, and I don't know, just something in my gut. If I was managing their brand, no, you don't go on the cover of Vogue while, and, and get this celebratory, fawning uh, profile. It's most, the profile is mostly about his wife. It's called The Portrait of Bravery, uh, a photography by Annie Leibowitz. And I know we have the meshing of culture and politics and entertainment and news and sports and everything is blurring together, but this is too much of a blur for me. I'll just leave it at that. Brand down for feeling safe. 52% of Americans fear they're in danger every day, a new study finds. Over half Americans feel they're in imminent danger at least once a day. A new poll of 2,000 Americans uh, analyzed. Younger Americans are most likely concerned about their safety on a daily basis, with 75% of those between 21 and 34 agreeing the statement compared to just 50% of those 25 to 54. Um, people just don't feel safe, and they don't feel safe in their home. Not a surprise with what we see in the news every day. Not a surprise with gun violence, but it's really taking its toll on the American psyche. Uh, brand up for Gen Z. Their savings account, the Gen Z is stashing away 14% of their income for retirement, more than old generation studies show. Really interesting. 
You got to give it to Gen Z workers. They defined the study of those aged in Gen Z 18 to 25 are sacking away an average of 14% of their, for their golden years, according to BlackRock. That compares with 12% of their older counterpart millennials and baby boomers. So it, it seems as if this generation is the most safe and conscious. You know, we always like to kind of take dumps on the younger generation. Oh, they don't know this, they don't know that. But the, those between 18 and 25 seem to be of a little bit more of a saving mindset. Brand alpha home prices, we're starting to see them plunge substantially. Uh, cratering demand, uh, given current conditions, U.S. home prices are likely, according to uh, Pantheon's ca uh, macroeconomics calculations, 15 to 20% overvalued. Uh, I think they are more so. I think you're going to see dramatic trip. But when you had home prices going up by 40% a year, they're going to be overvalued. And obviously, the, the, the tough economy, obviously, the, the rising interest rates, new single-family homes plunged by 8% in June. Uh, Commerce Department's data showed, and I think there's more of that to come. I think whenever you see a economic uh, downturn, housing is the next thing to come, and I think we're going to see it follows the stock market. Here's one that blew me away. Most expensive place to live in the, in the country. Is it New York City? No. Is it San Francisco? No. It is Jersey City, New Jersey. I'm going to say it again. The most expensive place to live in the country, according to rent, is Jersey City. It's located right across the Hudson River from Manhattan. For those of you who don't know, you stare at the skyline. It's right across, but it's not Manhattan. It's Jersey. It's Jersey City. Um, rent there now averages 5,500 bucks a month, according to the list listing portal Rent. Uh, compare that last month, the average rental price in Manhattan was $5,000. So I don't understand this. I just don't, you know, don't shoot the message. I don't know. That's a horrible expression. I don't want to use. Don't shoot. Don't, don't uh, question me and my veracity and my uh, willingness to tell the truth. I'm just reporting the facts here, as they say, just as ma'am. Jersey City, more expensive than Manhattan now. There you go. I don't understand it. I think I'll stay in Manhattan. Uh, brand up for company-wide vacations. More employees are turning to company-wide vacations to give their workers uh, more kind of mental health well-being. They're doing it because... The companies need to do something to attract workers. So starting um, a accounting firm, PwC, which is one of the big accounting firms, is giving 60,000 U.S. Employee employees two annual company-wide week-long breaks, one in July and one in December, in addition to their vacation time. A lot of companies were closing uh, a week in this, that week of between Christmas and New Year's in, uh, as it is now. Not a lot, but companies. But now they're doing it. They're doing it in July, a week in July also. So in addition to whatever the two or four or six weeks vacation you get, these are the companies are shutting down for two weeks, and more and more companies are going to do that. Once one comes, a lot of a lot of them follow. Under the guise of Western civilization ending as we know it, now you pay hotel pool chair fees when you go to stay to hotels. Those hotels are not as expensive enough. Um, mandatory nightly resort fees can top fifty. You you have what's called resort fees, the top fifty percent with tax, valet and self parking charges, plus fees for early check in, late check out, rollaway beds, and mini fridges. They're all coming up now. You were paying fees for those. Now, lounge chairs. If you stay at the Bellagio Resort in Las Vegas, where room rates run, you know, several hundred dollars to several thousand dollars a night. If you want a pool seat on the Friday of Labor Day weekend, it's 200 bucks a person. That gets you a standard lounge chair, a side table, umbrella, and towels. That's 200 bucks. That's not for a cabana. If you want a cushier day bed or cabana, that will set you back 570 bucks to 1200 bucks. At the Excalibur Hotel and Casino, Bellagio's budget, budget cousin, is at, that's the cheap, cheaper of the two hotels, They're asking 125 bucks for two chairs at its spring pool, slightly less than the nightly room pool price. So you got to pay for your pool chair now. I don't know. Brand up for UPS workers. They're rallying for AC. Let's, this is a hopeful. That what, what I didn't realize, this is UPS workers in New York City took to the streets to protest unsafe working conditions. Workers rallied outside of UPS distribution center in Brooklyn. It seems as if, uh, unlike Amazon and United States Postal Service, UPS trucks do not have AC and workers need to request fans. Come on, man. Come on. Let's go. UPS, put some air conditioning in those trucks. You, they, you make them wear brown uniforms and drive in brown trucks, at least give them air conditioning. Okay? Here was an interesting tidbit. Streaming services, brand up. Streaming hit a new milestone. Streaming made up one-third of television consumption among people in the U.S. last month per Nielsen. The highest percentage since the media measurement began in June of 2021. So now, a third of all TV hours are streaming. It's incredible. I, I, and that's going to obviously continue to grow and grow and grow. It's the reason that the, the broadcast networks uh, all have initiated streaming services because eventually that's where everybody's going to watch TV is streaming. Uh, and that's the way you'll get your 
they, they won't be broadcast television in a number of years. Uh, I don't know how many, but everything will be streaming. And that's where the world's going. Brand down from Marvel superheroes. There seems to be a box office slump. Uh, now look, Marvel, this is amazing. Since Disney and Marvel, they've made 25 super Marvel superhero movies that have made $25 billion. Uh, it's incredible. But the, the, the tough news for Marvel is that the last six, the six out of the last 12 movies, um, the last six averaged 773 million. And that's about half the average of the six before that. Now, some of that was part of this was during uh, COVID, but seems as if there's a little wear and tear in the suit. Look, you, you put something out so many times, at some point it's going to get dilutive. Now, they're still making over 700 million a movie. That's, that's quite a take, but there seems to be a softening in certain of the, of the franchises. So we're going to take a look at that. So Marvel, not so marvelous lately. I'm going to give Will Smith a brand up. Uh, uh, well documented what, what a jerk he was is for doing what he did with Chris Rock. But I thought he did a smart thing last week. It was the first time he spoke and he didn't do an interview with Oprah. He didn't do, he did a, just a, a online, YouTube online, took questions. There obviously the questions were uh, well organized. He knew the questions and whatnot. And there was, this thing was well coordinated, but it was just him talking and asking some, like five, or, answering five or six questions that were the obvious questions that people would ask. Very matter of factly, very uh, genuinely, I think a good first step. I don't think he's fatally wounded. I think he's wounded permanently. His brand will never be the same. But I think Will Smith will ride again. Uh, I thought it was a, just a very smart, well done. Look it up if you haven't seen it. Um, it was better than an interview. It was better than some primetime thing. It was something that was just viral uh, and very real and very raw. And I thought he did a good job of it. So I'm going to give him a brand up for that. Brand up for Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head celebrates 70 years and now there is Yama and Yampa Grand Tatters. I guess they are Mr. Potato Head, grandma, grandma and grandparent, grandparents. The set includes 24 pieces with two large potato bodies, two bases, and 20 Grand Tatter accessories that are compatible with, of course, other Potato Head toys. So Mr. Potato Head and Mrs. Potato Head, 70 years. Now there is Yama and Yampa Grand Tatters. Gotta love that. This one I love. This is my favorite brand of the week. Brand up, huge brand up for Applebee's lip gloss. There you go. Applebee's wing favorite lip glosses and dateable music video encourage saucy night outs. Now, Applebee's always has dating nights. It's known for that. So what they're doing now, they're, they're, they've created um, wing flavored lip glosses. They're calling them Saucy Gloss, a co-branded co product line with Winky Lux. Uh, it features four special edition glosses inspired by Applebee's wing sauce flavors. Get Me Hot Buffalo, Sweet Chili Kiss, Honey Barbecue Tea, and Be My Honey Pepper. Uh, and they're selling them alongside a music video showcasing real singles, all of whom wearing a flavor of glosses. Let me sing some of the, I'm not going to read the lyric. I'm not going to sing it. These lips are out of lockdown and inbound, so pick her up. I hope you like it spicy because I'm sauced, I'm hot sauced, glossed up. There you go. Who says people aren't thinking out there? Who says people are not creative? And speaking of creative, finally, Pickle Pizza. Start as a novelty, now it's taking off big. Uh, potentially decisive, um, it, it's divisive. But pickle pizza, it seems a food item in this year at the Minnesota Indiana State Fairs. And it seems to have caught a lot of attention. And there's rumors that we're going to be seeing pickle pizza in some of the national pizza chains. I, for one, doesn't seem to kind of appeal to my palate. But once again, who says no? Why not? Pickle pizza. And those are our brands of the week. Let's get right to our interview with Mark Leibovich. You're going to really enjoy this. If, 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 this is just fascinating. I am thrilled at today's guest, uh, Mark Leibovich, one of the most important political voices of our time. Uh, his new bestseller, after a string of number one times bestsellers, including The New Imperialist, particularly This Town, Citizens of the Green Room, The Big Game, and the new one is Thank You for Your Servitude, uh, which is uh, already causing major, major shockwaves uh, as it, it kind of re, it, what's so fascinating about it is it, it is not on the typical Trump story. It's all about the establishment critters around him that enabled this behavior. The, the, some of the cowards that we cover in the news all the time. Welcome Mark Leibovich. Thanks for being here, man. Great to be with you, uh, Donnie. It's, uh, you know, I've, I feel like I've known you for years, but we've never actually been, you know, in the same little studio. We've always sort of shared a table and actually I'm excited to talk about this because People never, when writers write a book, 
you never talk about the importance of, of what we're doing here, which is branding. Yeah. And that's not, that is not something that journalists usually talk about. It's, you know, we sort of figure, okay, that's for someone else to worry about. But when you sort of move from the, the newspaper or magazine realm to writing books, I mean, it's all about positioning and branding. And, you know, we have to try to think, you know, more sophisticated about these things than we normally do in our day job. So I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about it. That's great. We don't talk about it enough. So the interesting so. question, not an interesting question, our listeners will say it's interesting. So as you are <laughs> going through the process and you're writing this book, is that kind of in the back of your mind? You know, is it, is there, is there, a, it's a little less of a pure process or what, tell me how that kind of gets into your consciousness. It, it is. It's funny because I, I talk to when I talk to journalists who write their first books, and I learned this, you know, not the hard way, but I learned it definitely as I'm going. Is you realize that journalism and books are two different things. I mean, they're both journalism if it's nonfiction, right? But it is um, it's marketing too at a certain point. You are selling a specific product that you created, whereas if you work for the New York Times or the Atlantic or the Washington Post or whatever, you are selling their product. You're part of an ensemble cast. So um, it, it's, I don't tend to think of, but it's not front of mind when I'm writing it. Cause when I'm writing a book, it's just like getting the thing done. There's like the fear of God in you. It's like, okay, I got this deadline. I got all these blank pages ahead of me, but you realize as you're going on that like you, you see the marketplace, you see like, for instance, I'm, I'm writing a book about basically Trump is the main character, but it's not a Trump book. It's not yeah. trying to compete with what Maggie Haberman does or with what Bob Woodward does. I'm not trying to do a White House intrigue book because, you know, this is a different thing. I'm not trying to out biography anybody. I'm not trying to uh, write a campaign book. I'm trying to sort of position this very, very specifically as something different, something that is unique to what I do, and also something that's not going to overlap too much or really at all with what my competitors are going to do. So it's a different kind of proposition that we think about as we're going along. And yeah, I, I think it's it becomes more front of mind as we're finishing it and when we see what the product looks like. What It's so interesting. You know, when something comes out, you go, Duh, why wasn't this done? You know, right. we're, we've been all right. feverishly, you know, carrying, you know, covering the clown at the center of the circus. And right. the real kind of, not the real story, but the fa fascinating story that is not as obvious is the establishment enablers that allowed this uh, intruder to come. So what was the inspiration that kind of got you to this aha that after the fact, you're like, duh, this is this one, this one makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. You sort of listen to conversations you have around town and, and or even just with your friends. And one thing you hear over and over again is not so much, can you believe what Trump did today or what Trump tweeted today or what Trump said today? The, the more um, thing that people were more enraged about, it seems, is do you believe they are letting him do this? Mm -hmm. They, meaning Republicans, people who know better, people who said one thing in 2016 and who are saying another thing now, people who obviously have little respect for him in private, which I found to be true. I mean, I had a huge gap between what people say privately about Trump and what they say publicly about Trump. I mean, that's sort of been the two-step of the Republican Party over the last seven years. And I'm sure, you know, you have experienced this too, and I think we all have. So that in itself is maddening. I mean, it, it shows that, you know, politics are just sort of wearing their hypocrisy on their sleeve. P politicians are wearing their, their hypocrisy on their sleeve more than they usually do. And to me, that's a story, right? I mean, you it's obviously a delicate story because you don't want to burn people and you don't want to disclose private conversations and you don't want to break ground rules. But at the same time, to me, it's much more material and, and much fresher ground. And I, I sort of had a lot more, I think, room to operate there. Well, it was so fascinating. Were you surprised at how transparent the Lindsey Grahams and the Kevin McCarthys were? I mean, you kind of almost think it's somebody else talking and not yeah. them, some of the stuff that they were coming clean with. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I, I think part of it is I had pre-existing relationships with pretty much all these people just as a Washington political reporter yeah. for, for 20 years. So I knew them. But um, I think they had a level of confidence that the base of Republican support, especially for Trump, was not reading the New York Times. Um, and that's the bulk of where sure. I was working during my research there, almost all of it. So they, they kind of knew that, like, they were kind of speaking in semi-private to me. But ultimately, that's not how it works these days. I mean, I think people tweet out something, Trump reacts. And, and I think ultimately... Whether it seems unseemly for Kevin McCarthy or Lindsey Graham to talk about their fear of Trump or or how they're trying to make it work with Trump, Trump 
in his own way, is flattered by that. He loves people talking about it, obviously. He, he doesn't seem to discriminate that closely between when people might be speaking mockingly of him or when they're speaking respectfully of him. I mean, I think in most cases, like from my experience, it's mocking, but he didn't seem to differentiate. So it was a pretty fascinating process. I had always wondered on the air, and obviously the book gets a lot at this, I'm going to do like a manhood thing. I, I always wondered how these guys could allow, this is maybe my insecurity as a man, yeah, but I could yeah. never be a public toady, you know, subservient, uh, <laughs> acquiescent, use whatever soft yeah. word that was so on display. And I always wondered how they fit, yeah. forget even the politics of it, just as a, as a guy, how they face their friends, their loved ones, their children, their parents. That was always fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, it's, it is interesting. I, I mean, <laughs> masculinity in politics is, is a really fascinating topic, the way it's evolved, especially in the Republican Party. I mean, you sort of think of the classic branding in American advertising, right? It's like the Marlboro Man, sure. the sort of strong, silent type, the, um, you know, even just the like John Wayne, Ronald Reagan, I mean, great sort of actor and political brands. I mean, that's all Republican largely. This is, you know, sure, you know, walk tall and carry a big stick. I mean, the I mean, Lindsey Graham and Kevin McCarthy love being like 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 lapdogs here. I mean, that's sort of their whole play. And they know it might be unseemly, but they figure that if it wins, if it wins for them, if it makes it work for them, it will all be redeemed. And Trump himself, by the way, is not a classically masculine figure at all. I mean, he's he's kind of, um, you know, he's always complaining. <laughs> he's always the victim. He is, he is someone who does not carry a big, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't speak softly, that's for sure. Yeah. And yeah, he's kind of a drama queen. So uh, yeah, a lot of that's been turned on its head, but I agree. I, I couldn't do it. I don't think it's worth a job. I don't think it's worth the indignity of it. And, um, but apparently there's a pretty large cast of characters who are willing to play that role. I want to just stay on Lindsey Graham for a second. I understand, it doesn't take a, a lot to figure out these guys want to keep their jobs and, and they're going to get right. priority and I always wonder, though, after they win and they've got a six-year yeah. run, runway, and yeah. obviously the world changes so much, why right. they can't grow a set why at that point. Why they keep doing Yeah, that, that the part, I, I can understand the logic before then. But no, you're not a congressman. You're not running every two years. You've got that long runway. That's the part that amazes me. I totally agree. I mean, I think two cases where I've thought about this a lot are Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham. They both won their races a year, year and a half ago. They have six years in front of them, now five years in front of them. Um, you know, in both cases, there is a, there's a separate calculation. McConnell wants to be the majority leader. Mm -hmm. So right now it's 50-50. So he's basically the minority leader. He wants, he doesn't want to alienate his caucus. He doesn't want to alienate the base. So he needs those votes. So he's got to sort of play it careful. With Graham, Graham doesn't just need to be the senator from South Carolina. I mean, he needs that job really badly. There, I think any of his colleagues would say that there are few people in, in the Senate who need the job as badly mm -hmm. as Lindsey Graham does. But Graham needs to be on the golf course with Trump. He wants to be a player. He wants to be at the dice table, as he says. He loves to be the guy. He loves to be the Gilligan to the skipper on I the know, golf course, I love course, that, right? I love that. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's it's 100% true. He did it with McCain. He, he just loves to be in the mix like that. And it gets, it gets him great deals of sustenance. And it's really weird, but it's a big part of his day-to-day -day calculation. There are some heroes in the book. And who would have thought years ago we'd be referencing Mitt Romney as a, Liz Cheney, yeah. and Liz Cheney as, yeah. and we no surprise with John McCain, but as pillars of bravery and common sense yeah. and dignity, I, you, you just, it's, it's almost unfathomable. It, it is. And, and I get really impatient with people on the left who, you know, you, you mentioned something, you know, laudatory about Mitt Romney or Liz Cheney, and they will immediately say, oh, well, Liz Cheney, look what her father did, the Iraq war and Mitt Romney, you know, look how he flip flopped on abortion and this and that. And remember what he was, I mean, it's just my feeling is, and I, I assume a lot of people agree. I mean, I know a lot of people do agree, which is that it's never too late to do the right thing. Yeah. And I think the stakes here are extremely high. And even when it's the bare minimum, I mean, Mike Pence, you know, did the bare minimum at the end. I think it should be praised. I mean, obviously, nothing exists in a vacuum and there's a larger context. But, uh, yeah, I'm all for anyone doing the right thing, no matter how late in the game it is. Yeah, I and mean, Liz Cheney in particular will go down as, yeah. as, as an American hero. 
Um, Absolutely. You, you've talked about that you believe, as most people do, Trump will run again, and uh, I do too. But I actually think, and you've, I've talked about this there, and you, you've talked about it in interviews, that the way to defeat Trump is to brand him the very thing that he's most terrified. Hey, this guy's a loser. Guess what? He, he lost Absolutely. all three times popular vote. He lost the midterms. He got trounced last time around. A lot of his candidates, like, you don't, you don't have to diss him any more than go, look, I believe and I like Donald Trump, but we, we can't lose. This is about winning and losing. It, it's such a right. dud to me, and, and it's, it's such a dud to you also. Absolutely. And, and look, I mean, you can mock him. You can say, look, do you know how hard it is to lose to Joe Biden? Yeah. I mean, you know how receptive in a Republican audience that would be? I mean, this guy is a flat out, straight up loser. He is. And, and you don't need to throw a lot of facts out there because yeah. they're all just flat hiding in plain sight. I mean, he's the first president in 100 years to lose the White House, the House and the Senate for his party yeah. in one term. Uh, you know, like you said, he lost the popular vote, uh, you know, twice, probably a third time if he runs again. He was impeached twice, uh, lowest popularity rating. I mean, just go down the list. I mean, this guy is toxic for Republicans. And, you know, no one went down to Plains, Georgia to kiss the ring of Jimmy Carter after he lost in 1980. Yeah. I mean, Democrats wanted to move on from him, just yeah. like Republicans wanted to move on from Bush 41 in 19. 19- uh, 92. I mean, it, it's just there's no precedent for this, and, yeah. and I don't know why they're being so shy about it. That's a you. You just created a great campaign ad that you didn't all, I though? Why you, doesn't anyone listen? To like, me? like it just literally, you just basically you put him together in a bucket with 41 Absolutely. and Jimmy Carter. These are the guys. Yeah, these well, are incumbents in our lifetime that lost, and yep. you know they wrote into the sunset. And it's great, and and maybe it, like it just. Uh, it's so obvious that it's it's, it's so obvious. Yeah. I mean, also, if you want to keep going, you can say, look, Joe Biden loses to every Republican except Donald Trump. Yeah. Now, that's probably overstating it a little bit because I mean, there's not a lot of polling. But, yeah, just throw it out there. Yeah. I mean, it's just he's got no he's got no answer to that except for lies. You've also been very forthcoming. And I agree with you on this, that Joe Biden uh, is not up. It does not have his fastball anymore. We just got to call it as we see no. it. He's not up for the job. He appears old. He is not. You know, everybody keeps hollering about messaging, messaging, messaging the Democrats. No, it's the messenger. He doesn't, you don't lean in when he speaks. Uh, yep. I mean, I'm a Democrat, but I, I call it as I see it. And the guy is just, does not seem in charge, does not have his hands firmly on the wheel, and he doesn't inspire. You need to make people feel a certain way, particularly yep. now, if you're a Democrat, the fear that you're feeling coming off of Roe v. Wade, coming what's going on with, with the Supreme Court, what's going on with January 6th, what's going on with guns, you need a leader up there to tap into that fear, that rage, that emotion, and it's just not there. It's just not there. Absolutely. And like, look, if there was ever a time when Democrats needed someone who knew how to use the bully pulpit, you know, whether it's a Bill Clinton or, you know, Barack Obama, who who was more effective at first. But I mean, look, I mean, they're, they were both at the top of their games yes. when they were in the White House. I mean, and I, I think that this goes, Donnie, to a basic misconception that Democrats and probably Biden himself were operating with, which is that they think that, well, Biden thinks, I know because he's been saying this for years, that as soon as you take yourself out of play, you are, no one takes you seriously anymore, right? You're either on the way up or on the way down in politics. I think it's just the opposite. I think it would signal to the, the Democrats that we are not afraid of our future. We are going to look to the future. It would give a breath of fresh air to both other candidates who are considering this, but also a debate, but also to his own reputation. It would be like, yeah, everyone kind of knew they were electing a caretaker anyway. I mean, his yeah. one job was to land the plane, beat Trump. He did. He'll go down in history for that. It's probably his chief accomplishment. And, you know, I, I think he has been a gentleman. I think he hasn't tweeted like a madman into the night. So that's a win. And, um, you know, we got a lot of work to do. So, I mean, thank you, Joe Biden. You're going to be 82 in two years. I mean, uh, you know, right off into the sunset. You've deserved it. But yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I'm, I think that he should step aside and I think the sooner the better. The question I get asked all the time, and I'm sure you do also, is what's with the bench? Where Where is the Democrat? Who, who, okay, that's great. Who's next? Yeah. We, we know Kamala is is not the answer, certainly does not appear to be, and has been very yeah. disappointed no matter where you come from. And then you go, yeah. okay, where are the where are the the bright young governors? Where where are the senators? Where are the people from the private sector? And you just don't have I mean, you've got Newsom who's making some noise now, but he's he's got yeah. his problems. But where's the bench? Well, I, I think that could come into focus after the midterms. I mean, I think 
someone like John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, if he were to win, um, he's a new face. He's yeah. very authentic. Yes. Uh, you know, we, I mean, kind of a small town mayor and like a, on steel country, um, lieutenant governor now. Uh, he's been a very strong candidate. You know, he's had a stroke, so he's coming back from that. And, and that's not a small thing. But, you know, he could take off. Yeah. Uh, I, you can see that, especially with a convincing victory on a very a high-profile national race. I mean, Dr. Oz is, you know, obviously getting a lot of attention as his opponent. Tim Ryan in Ohio, I think, oh, has a longer shot. I always liked him. Him. I always liked him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very strong, especially yeah. for Ohio. Youngstown, Katie Vance. the whole thing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, no. He's got, he's got, he's got a lot going for him. And if he can win, it's a major upset. It immediately puts him on the map. Um, and then I think less likely a Stacey Abrams or maybe a, um, I don't know, if if someone can pull an upset. Uh, or, or you know, even a senator like like Amy Klobuchar, who we haven't heard much about in the last few years, Chris Murphy of Connecticut. I mean, there's there's a bunch that I, I think, especially if they're propelled by midterm victories, um, you know, could could make a name for themselves pretty quickly. Because I don't think people are going to say, "Well, you're brand new." I mean, that that, yeah, that no. equation doesn't seem to work no, anymore. No, no. And, and you know, there are some business people like Mark Cuban that you hear about that you know, who knows? But um, yeah, so I, I think the bench tends to. Will will present itself, you know, at pretty soon after the midterms, and hopefully it's more than just Biden and Kamala, because I think if it is, the right, Democrats right. might be in might real be trouble. In trouble. You obviously, DeSantis is the dissuasive sure Republican right now, but you you've been on record as saying you don't think he's going to wear very well. I find him a very scary guy. I find him find him yeah. scarier than Trump in some means because there's the, the fascist leanings, but he's in a much better package. You can't just point to him and go look at the clown. So he he really scares the fuck out of me. Yeah, he he is. Um, yeah, I, I don't think he will wear well. I think if you talk to people who have worked with him, Republicans in the House, uh, fellow Republican governors, he, you know, he doesn't. He, I, they don't think he is going to wear well. And I have a, I imagine if he goes against Trump, and I pre- presume, you know, if I don't, I don't think he'll step aside if Trump runs. I agree. Uh, Trump will will have like a field day with him because he's just the kind of socially awkward character who's not immediately likable and, and not great on his feet, it seems, um, that, that Trump could, you know, I think get, get you know, cause a lot of trouble for. So that's my instinct. I, and I, you know, I don't think people know DeSantis. I think people sort of like the idea that he's not Trump. They sort of like the idea that he triggers all the right people. Um, so he could probably, I mean, and he seems to be polling pretty well or quite well early, but uh, I don't see it myself, but what do I know? So back to the book, the hotel, the Trump Hotel in Washington is is kind of the cheers, the centerpiece, is a character in the book, in effect. And what yeah. to you, what what stood out most to you about the hotel and how it became, you got Rudy Giuliani with his at BLT with his little uh, plaque and on and on and on, how it really is a character. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the hotel itself is definitely a character. I mean, I think when you're writing a book that you are hoping will sell kind of as a, um, what you're, you're trying to create a world, right? I mean, Washington, I, I've done this with all my Washington books. I mean, there've been three now. You're trying to sell a world, right? I mean, I'm not someone who is going to hopefully rise or fall on the 10 nuggets, right? I mean, that's sort of the industrial complex that these books operate on. Like, oh, look, you know, so-and-so is reporting that Mike Pence, um, you know, D- Donald Trump, you know, held Mike Pence over the Truman balcony with his by his ankles one day. Isn't that wild? Or, yeah. you know, he, he started crying. I mean, I mean, you know, people just, that's usually how they, people sell these books. I wanted to create a world. I mean, I wanted to create a, sort of a cinematography around Washington. And the Trump Hotel was... Like you said, it's Cheers, it's Rick's Americans, ca- Rick's American Cafe. Like, there's gambling going on here. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> shop, shop, right? And and if you ever go in there, I mean, I I I, was, I used to go in there all the time. And so if you can like you know hang out at a restaurant and a bar on the company dime, it's it's great. But um, it was such a scene. I mean, you'd have elected officials, you'd have Rudy, you'd have you know Steve Mnuchin, you'd have his wife with a little. You know, yeah. purse dog. Um, you'd have Trump himself, like, Star- Cinderella coming into the castle. Star Wars like, bar, know. yeah. I, I mean, it was the Star Wars bar. Paul Ryan actually literally called it the Star I didn't Wars know that. bar, but it sort of was like that. And people would be drinking really heavily um, because you know they. they not, I mean, the White House was not a fun place to work, from what I could tell. Um, so yeah, I wanted to do sort of a recurring theme there because it kind of brings a, a kind of a. a a visual scene to to the book to sort of propel the narrative a little bit. So you mentioned Paul Ryan, a fascinating character in that he was such an important figure and was a casualty of Trump. I mean, he, you know, he talked no about, doubt. he talks about in the book about, you know, crying on January 6th. And, and give me your take on Paul Ryan. 
You know, I'm I'm not one of these black and white guys on on these people. I mean, again, like I mean, Paul Ryan. A lot of people like did not have a lot of use for him. I mean, a lot of people on the right they thought he was a never Trumper. Um, it kind of was, but a lot of people on the left thought, okay, he's just sort of you know uh, bowing down to Trump, and he just wants his tax cuts, and then he'll get out of the way. Um, Paul Ryan is. You know, was he a profile in courage? No, I, I think he's still not necessarily a profile in courage. He still sits on the board of Fox News. But I think he genuinely kind of agonized over the position he was in. Um, he's a pretty religious guy. He wants to do the right thing. He does not like Donald Trump. He does not like Donald Trump's style. He got into politics, you know, over 20 years ago, hoping to be a gentleman, do the right thing, you know, get some things done. I mean, is he conservative? Absolutely. But I don't know. I, I always found him to be a fairly sincere guy, a good guy, um, someone who wants to do well, who really was not cut out for this kind of politics. Um, if politics were more about policy, more about, you know, gentlemanly games, like, you know, 10 years ago, he probably would have been better suited. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not one of these black and white guys. Again, I think it's complicated. I think, you know, when he sort of burst into tears watching the riots break out on January 6th, it was genuine. Um, and, you know, I asked him this. I said, Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you know, were any of these, you know, tears of complicity? Did you feel guilt over? Maybe you could have done more. And, you know, I pointed out that he's still on the board of Fox News and and he didn't really want to go there but I I I don't know I think I think he's a decent human being who found himself in a really really bad situation and probably does have some regrets but he wasn't about to share them with me Speaking of Fox News what's going to be interesting in the upcoming uh, elections is you could see Rupert Murdoch is kind of turned off to Trump I mean it's you're seeing it in the Wall Street Journal you're seeing it in the Post you're not as much seeing it in Fox News yet but I think yeah. that's to come and you lose that you lose a Big, big, big part of your cloud. I, I agree. I, I think people, I mean, people, I think, still under, believe it or not, still underestimate the power of Fox. And I think to some degree, Trump spent so much time complaining about Fox News late in the campaign. And then when they declared Arizona for um, for Biden, I mean, he wouldn't shut up about it. And they became the enemy for a while. But ultimately, yeah, he needs Fox. I mean, I, I always was the, of the belief that Richard Nixon probably could have survived Watergate if he had Fox News. Um, yes. He had the drumbeat of Sean Hannity and and Laura Ingram and, and um, you know, Tucker Carlson every single night, you know, being the biggest, you know, talking to the biggest cable news audience in America. I, I think it would have been a complete game changer. I mean, Rupert Murdoch is probably at the end of his life. I mean, he's he's well into his, what, 80s, almost 90? I, 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 I don't know. He's, he's up there. He's, uh, he's, around, um, he's around 90. He's, got, he's there. He's, he's around, around 90. 90. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it seems like he, he has more sway with the print properties at this point because I, I don't really see much indication that Sean Hannity takes direct or, or, or Tucker Carlson takes direct no. orders from Rupert or even like Lachlan or... or um, or, you know, any of the people in the family. But I, I could be wrong. But sure, I, I think if Fox, you know, goes heavy into DeSantis, it could be a real problem for Trump in the primaries. You, you mentioned some of these critters, the Tucker Carlson's of the world. I, I wonder how much of with these guys, and, and he's a loathsome, loathsome character, how much is performance art and how much is this is who these people are? Is it a little bit of the Trump syndrome that he hears the applause and that becomes his kind of modus operandi? Because you say to yourself, yeah. can they be that loathsome? And does that make them even worse, even if they are doing performance art, you know? Yeah, I, I have to say it, it's it got to be. I mean, like, you, I don't think this is all true belief. I mean, I think they're all probably authentic conservatives on some level. Sure, of course. I think after a while, um, something just takes on a life of its own. I think it's the fame. I mean, TV itself is a warping thing. Like, I've I've known... Um, so many print journalists who have gone to TV, I mean, with some exceptions, but I've known a lot of them who change, right? I mean, they they get defined by the red light going on. Yeah. And like they look at the ratings and they become different people. They are, whether they realize it or not, they, they're just sort of performing every night. Yeah. And that becomes a bit of an addiction and it becomes their identity. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think at a certain point, I mean, the, the product speaks for itself. Um, and, you know, whether they're just sort of winking on the side or not uh, becomes irrelevant. But, I mean, it, it is worth pointing out that there are a lot of private communiques, like emails and texts, you know, especially around January 6th from these folks that that do show that they are playing both sides or trying to. Yeah. So, 
I don't know. That doesn't exactly um, inspire, you know, great admiration for, for me. But I mean, unfortunately, it's the world we're living in. The new book kind of gets into this, I'll call it the swamp that's surrounding, you know, this 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 Trump orbit. And obviously you booked this town was kind of an expose into the Washington swamp uh, earlier on. And your your football book, The Big Game, was kind of looking at the kind of NFL swamp. What are the parallels yeah. of the NFL? We say the, the characters in the NFL, the owners, Goodell, the, the people that you explore, and kind of the swamp yeah. things in the Trump orbit. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, it's a lot of powerful, you know, largely men. Um, they're deeply insecure. They have outsized wealth and power more than they probably know what to do with. And, you know, I think I just don't I mean, I, I know a lot of politicians. I know a lot of um, billionaires, actually, you know, especially from the NFL book. I mean, all the owners are billionaires. Sure, they are not like me. They are not like most people I know. There, There is just something that whether it's protectiveness or paranoia, but something that sort of makes you feel like you can run for president, right? <laughs> right? I mean, president, not Senate. I mean, president. You, I mean, I myself could not imagine thinking that I would do a better job here than anyone else, and I'm going to go for it. Yeah. I mean, the, the act itself to sort of jump into politics to the degree that you have to, like, being on, you know, 17 hours a day and, and groveling and like, you know, again, subverting your manhood, to, you know, to the degree they do. I mean, it's it's warping. How can it not be? And and same with billionaire football owners. I mean, it's a weird world. And I think if I do have an interest, I mean, I'm, I've always been, and I think this is true of a lot of journalists, I have always been had my nose pressed against the glass. I mean, I don't, I don't think I could operate in a world like this. First of all, I don't have a billion dollars. Right. But, I mean, if someone wants to give it to me, I'd happily try. But it, it's, um, yeah, I do seem like to be attracted to this. It's a pretty, I think it's a rich environment for human nature and sort of seeing the frailties of human nature and also the frailties that 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 still um, that still haunt people even when they seem like the most powerful person in the world or the richest person in the world, right? So, um, yeah, that seems to be the way it, it sorts itself out in my body of work. I mean, it, it didn't, wasn't any grand plan at the beginning, but that seems to be uh, where I've done a lot of work at in, in you know, in over 30 years. How are you feeling about things heading into the midterms? You know, I, I still, I think Republicans will win the House. I, I think there's just too much, you know, cr just too much current yeah. moving against Democrats, just historically, you know, gerrymandering, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I think the president and inflation uh, are one and one a big, big problems for Democrats. I, I think it's not it's not impossible that that Trump himself could cough up a few Senate seats for uh, Republicans. I mean, I think the Herschel Walker seat, if if Republicans wind up losing that, that was a winnable seat. Yes. The Dr. Oz seat in Pennsylvania, that was a probably maybe winnable seat. Uh, he might lose that. I mean, you know, the Eric Greitens in, in Missouri, if he winds up winning. I mean, there, there's a lot of Trump candidates. I mean, J.D. Vance, maybe, that if they lose, I think Trump will be blamed for in the same way that he was l blamed for losing those two Senate seats in Georgia, which, by the way, is another part of his rap sheet that you could throw at him. Yes. And, you know, in the in the loser In the loser category. So, yeah. So I do think the, the Democrats' best hope in the Senate is that is Trump himself, because I think that he's clearly playing and, and I think is working at cross purposes with what Mitch McConnell wants. So we'll see how that shakes out. A little bit of the life and times of Mark Leibovich. I didn't mention in the intro, you know, for uh, years, your Washington Post, New York Times, kind of basically ran the Times Magazine for many, many, many years. And now, now you're at the Atlantic. How is life different? Uh, so far, so good. It's only been a few months. I mean, it, I was, you know, I did 25 years at daily newspapers, at the Post and at the New York Times, and then actually at the San Jose Mercury News for four years before that. And yeah, so I've, I've been around and I missed magazine writing. Um, you know, the New York Times was great. I, I loved it. I was there 16 years. Um, the institutional weight of the place can get a little heavy after a while, by which I mean, um, you know, you, you become like the New York Times guy, right? And yeah. I had a lot of freedom there and I had a lot of... Um, you know, I had a lot of... I had some great editors there and I made friends that I will always have there. But... I think change is good, and I think change from an institution that has come to define you is also good. So I figure I had another 
one or two you know career moves left in me, and I figure I would try the Atlantic because I, I love the Atlantic. I think um, they've been doing amazing work, and they have sort of a dream team of writers. They really do now, yeah, just, right. yeah. That I've just been reading for years and, and just admiring for years, and uh, it's been great so far. And I, we started out talking about branding, and I asked this of all of my guests. So, what's the Mark Leibovich brand? You know, the Mark Leibovich brand, I think. I mean, at the end of the day, is is a I'm a print reporter. I, I don't want to sort of think of myself as like a TV guy. I don't want to think of myself as um, I, I mean, I mean, there's sort of, there's sort of a um, kind of an art in journalism to sort of brand yourself without making it look like you're trying to brand yourself because you know branding is not something that journal, we're just ink stained. Oh, registers, sure, right? of we're course, just, of course. We're just like shoe leather guys, yeah. Right? We look, we're like look faces for radio, faces right. for, for print, that kind of thing. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, my feeling is if you do the work print wise, the rest of the brand takes care of itself. If, if you can write memorable stories that hold up, that get the right kind of attention, obviously the wrong kind of attention is, you know, you mess something up or whatever. Um, you, you know, the rest of the brand will take care of itself, whether it's in books, whether it's in something, you know, TV or, or movies or something like that. But, but ultimately, uh, it is a, I, I love the job. I mean, I love print journalism. It's hard as hell. It's never come easy to me. It, it's, you know, no matter how hard I try, I can't be effortless about it. The only, it takes real effort to look, make it look like it's effortless, right? So, yeah. um, you know, I've been really lucky. I think basically the brand is, is you know, do as much good work in your day job as possible. Treat people well. Uh, hopefully don't, you know, don't be a jerk. And, um you know, hopefully, uh, you know, be proud of what you do when it comes time to to do something else. So that that's my brand. I know it's way too verbose. No, it's not. To I well said. Describe your brand brand in that way, but that's sort of that's how I would say it. Mark Leibovich, an important voice, the new bestseller after a string of bestsellers. Thank you for your servitude. Don't just walk, run out and get it. And I'll see you on Morning Joe, my friend. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Donnie, thanks for having me on. It was fun. All right, you stay well, okay. Thanks for listening to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I am Donnie Deutsch, and you can get our podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Spotify, Apple, any place else you get podcasts. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts. And watch our video on YouTube. Download them there, and please leave your comments on, on YouTube for our videos also. And we'll see you next time on On Brand. Stay safe. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.